All right, everybody's good? Everybody's good? How many of you guys watched the debate last night? Anybody watch it online? No? So few of you. All right. Huh? What debate is that what you're saying? <laughs> Ken Ham out at the Museum of uh, Creation uh, debated uh, Bill Nye, the science guy. Bill didn't look so good. No, it was good. It was good. Good to, you know, challenge people to think. Um, four more weeks of Philippians, and then we're going to do Daniel starting the first week in March. Is that right? March? Unless, I'm trying to work out with Don Stewart. We'll see if we can work it out in his schedule to come on that night after we finish um, Philippians. He wants to do like a question and answer night and just sit up here and have you throw questions at us. So if he can come, we'll do that in between. But otherwise, we'll just go right into him and tell Don, forget it, take a hike, get lost, good going. <laughs> That's it. Um, he had some obligations, but he thought maybe that he could move them around anyway. So that's our plan, our plan, our prayer. Let's open our Bibles tonight to Philippians 4. Final chapter, four more weeks. Paul wrote this letter to the Philippian church, the first church ever planted in Europe. And he was a part of that. He wrote it to them about 10 or 12 years after the church was planted in 62 AD. He was under house arrest in Rome. He was awaiting sentencing from Nero. He was either going to get the death sentence or he was going to be let go. We know from history that he was pardoned, at least for the time being, got to spend maybe 16 to 18 months roaming around. There are some indications of where he went. Not a lot written, though. And then he was rearrested and he was killed for his faith um, a couple of years later. So Paul writes this wonderful book to thank the church for 12 years of support. But it really kind of grows from a thank you letter into this wonderful book about joy. In every chapter, Paul talks about joy, the kind of joy we can have and what can get in the way of it and what we can do to keep it. In chapter 1, he talked about circumstances and how they are so out of our control, but we can have a single mind when it comes to them. For me to live as Christ, die as gain, that'll take care of most circumstances. In chapter 2, he spoke about having a submitted mind that would keep me walking in joy despite people who are sometimes far less than perfect. But he said, you know, don't do anything out of vain glory. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ. In chapter 3, Paul spoke about having a spiritual mind because joy can be stolen when you start to want the things of the world and you don't have them. Or the glory of the world or the, the pride that comes with it. And so Paul wrote about the people in the world being, you know, worldly-minded or earthly-minded. <clears throat> at the end of verse 19, setting their mind on earthly things. He said, but we're, we're from heaven. We're, our citizenship is there. We're just passing through. We're eagerly waiting for the Lord to come. Tonight in chapter 4, Paul turns to anxiety and victory over worry. And really the whole chapter discusses having a mind that is secured through prayer and thanksgiving and, and much rejoicing in the Lord and letting God know our problems, but then his peace ruling your heart. And so because it's such an important subject, we're only going to do five verses tonight, and we're only going to do verse six and seven next week, and we're only going to do eight and nine the next week, or maybe eight, nine, and ten. We can sneak in ten. But <clears throat> next week, we're just going to look at plain worrying. Tonight, <clears throat> we're going to look at the worry that stress in relationships develops, and what it gives us when we're at odds with people, and how difficult it can be both to be a witness and to be at peace. So Paul will talk to us about the right responses in battle, the right praying, the right thinking, and the right living as solutions to develop uh, or, or to deliver us from anxiety and keep us uh, joyful in the Lord. The word anxious, verse 6, is the word for worry. It, it, it means, um, well, it means a lot of things, but it basically means to have troubled thoughts or to be unduly concerned. The old English word for anxious meant to strangle. I think that's a pretty good description of, of worrying, isn't it? It's, it's kind of like it, it, it grabs you. It can make you sick, and it can make you emotionally distressed, and it can certainly disturb your digestion and cloud your thinking and steal your joy. But that's not God's will. That's the way the world works. So Paul devotes an entire chapter, except for the last few verses when he kind of signs off, to this issue of worry. It's a killer that God would have you avoid as, as, as 
his children. In fact, from a spiritual standpoint, <clears throat> worry is just wrong thinking. Worry is absolutely just wrong thinking. And it produces wrong feelings. And you can't get rid of it by yelling out loud, quit worrying. <laughs> but there are steps that you can take. In fact, we will read here in, in the next couple of weeks that the Lord says that, that God's peace and his rest and, and his joy will guard our hearts. The word means to garrison, to literally plant himself around us so nothing gets in. That he kind of shelters our hearts and our minds. And um, that's what Paul speaks to in this chapter. I always appreciate Paul's letters because, you know, so often in the world, it seems when you have needs or issues, people want to respond to you with, with pat answers or, or kind of canned responses. You know, even when they're sincere, they don't really help. It's when you call and you get answered by some robot, you know, and, and the computer says this to you, we are very much concerned with your call. And I'm thinking, no, you're not. You're not even answering the phone. <laughs> if you have a problem with this, push one. And if it's that, push two. And then you get down to you know, push 86. Oh, come on. I'm pushing zero. Get me someone to talk to right now. I can't believe it. Like form letters, right? You get form letters. So you're, com you're sending a complaint or inquiry form letters. But Paul doesn't send any form letters. He, he knows the people. He loves the folks. He knows the Lord. Each of his letters is focused on the church to whom he writes. There, there's new and specific and very clear and, and concise information he doesn't send the legalism letter to the Galatians and the joy letter to, from Philippi or the fear nothing letter. He's always pretty engaged. And so th this final chapter, he, he gets really into it as far as, you know, some things that are practical that you can do. In fact, even in our five verses tonight, you'll read the word stand fast and I implore you and I urge you rejoice in the Lord. Let your gentleness be known. And they're all written from the standpoint of military terms, commands, not suggestions. These aren't like, hey, you know what you could do. It was kind of like when your father sits you down and talks to you like this. That's what this reads like. Do this. <laughs> don't do that. Do this. Don't, don't do that. And so that's the way it comes across that speak about a fight of faith that we can engage in and win. Um, the, the battle certainly that you and I as Christians fight is with the world and with the flesh, with the devil. That's what John writes in 1 John 2.16. Those are the things that are not of the, of the Lord. They're of the world. But that battle is theologically easy to understand, but the confrontations and the reality of it are, are far less abstract, aren't they? I mean, you go to work and you have difficulties, or you, you're at home you have problems. You, you, you tend to be attacked with everyday, in, in everyday life with people that you know and love, or strangers that you've never met, or in situations that you find yourself, and, and the attacks come up between friends, and they divide families, and they can get involved with church brothers and sisters, and yet we have to stand fast. And certainly Paul's counsel to us tonight, and he gives us four things, and I'll try to articulate them so I don't leave any out. But there's four things that Paul gives to us that we have to engage in to stand fast and to remain strong And tonight in terms of relationships and making sure there's no harboring of resentments and hard-heartedness towards others and all the stuff that undermines really what God wants to do in you and through your life. So um, from a militant standpoint, Paul says, stand fast. But then he doesn't want you to be ineffective, so he wants you to stay strong. So let me give you a couple of things to think about. In verse 1, we need to battle instability. Instability. Let's, let's look at verse 1. Paul says, therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren. It's nice to be called that, isn't it? Those whom I love and, and I long for as my family. You are my joy and my crown. Stand fast in the Lord, beloved. But notice the word therefore, which refers back to what Paul was saying even in our last study about living with an eye on heaven, looking for eagerly and waiting for Jesus. Don't get caught up in the world and in the flesh as the enemy rages back to verse 18 and 19. And Paul wants them to see that they are different than that group amongst themselves. And we talked about that last week, that in the city of Philippi and in the church at Philippi, there was a group and a cult and a legalistic bunch of guys who were dividing the body. They were enemies of God's grace, we were told. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their glory is in their shame, but their mind is set on earthly things. But this group was in the city, and it was within the greater church, and they claimed a spiritual place 
Paul paints them as legalists, hateful, divisive, if you will, enemies of God, driven by the flesh, earthly-minded. And then he says in verse 20, we're not like that at all. We have the mind of Christ. We are the body of Christ. So Paul begins this chapter about anxiety by saying, as far as that, that battle is concerned, look, beloved, my beloved, long for brethren. You have a unique place in my heart. I love you. I care for you. I miss you. I would like to be with you. He said in chapter 1, you're going to be my joy. He said in chapter 2, you're going to be my crown in heaven as fruit that would re remain. I want you to stand fast in the Lord. Stako, it's one word. And it's a military command, and it means don't move. Persevere. Persist. You know, one of the things that happens to us as Christians is Satan would really like to exploit you and take advantage of opportunities in your life to get you to run away to back away, to compromise, to, to somehow, oh, I didn't mean it like that, I'm backing away. Pressure comes on, difficulties, and, and, and if he can get you to clam up or shy away from the conflict because, you know, you're standing fast, but if there's trouble, you can't stand fast too long. Then he's got you. And Paul said, man, I love you guys, but you can't give in. You have to stand fast. You are, as well as I am, I know, around groups, who do not take well to your spiritual devotion. They don't really share your spiritual values. They, they don't have the convictions that you do, whether that group is your work partners or it's the class that you're in at school or, or maybe it's a majority of your family or sometimes even in your home. But when you're with them, you quickly feel outnumbered by them. And you find yourself under crowd kind of pressure, peer pressure, or some kind of heavy-duty pressure to come along with the group, to buckle under. And all of a sudden, their convictions take the upper hand while yours are pushed back and silenced and intimidated, and you're left fearful. And unfortunately, that happens to the church a lot in our culture. There are loud people out there with loud demands that are as immoral as they can be. And the church, rather than going, yeah, I'm not getting involved, that says nothing, they, we back away. We don't stand fast, we don't stand firm, we get jelly legs, and we kind of roll away. Peer pressure is one of the most difficult and, and most powerful forces on the earth. About eight years ago, there was a teacher who was teaching, uh, actually other teachers about peer pressure, who did an experiment in his class. It was uh, 11th graders, and there were 20 students in the class, and he drew three lines on the chalkboard. One was obviously smaller, one was obviously longer, and then one was pretty close to the long one, but, but, but significantly smaller to know that wasn't really the longest one. And then he told 16 of the people beforehand, when I point to the middle one, the second longest, and I say, is this the longest one? I want you all to raise your hand and say yes. And 92% of the time, the other four folks, well, yeah, I guess that's right, it's the longest. It was definitely the sh not the longest. You could see it as clearly as it could be. And they, they repeated the experiment at every level of, of grade up to the sophomores in college and found for between 75 and 90 percent of the kids who were in on the deal getting sucked in by the deal. So peer pressure is powerful. There was a group, according to verse 17 and 18 and 19, who were really troublesome people who called themselves Christians, believers, but they stumbled others. And they were loud, and they were forceful, and they were difficult to deal with. And Paul said, you know, I love you guys, but you're going to have to stand fast now. We have to take a stand for Jesus. And when you cast your lot in with him, you certainly discover people who don't share your devotions quick enough. And they usually begin to oppose you, suggesting you're fanatical, offering other ideas, seeking to add or subtract from your commitment or your faith. And the result is that you become unstable in your spiritual well-being. You're good at church, you're singing loudest, your hands are the highest, and then you get to work and you oh man, you're like a shrinking violet. You don't know what to say, you don't know what to do, and, and now you're conflicted. You're, you're good here, you're not so good there. And it, it produces kind of that, that difficulty. And, and what happens is, you know, there was a time when you had this wonderful simplicity in Jesus, but now when you start witnessing and sharing, now people turn on you and you begin to feel moved and turned around and you're on shaky ground and you feel unstable. And yet Paul's word to the, those family that he loved, to the family was, you got to stand, man. You don't, don't allow yourself to be moved. Be stationary. 
It's kind of like the order given by a commander to troops that are surrounded in a battle situation and they feel threatened and they're insecure. And so, you know, they want to run or turn, but he says, no, stay put. Battle's not over. So we have to do what's right and stick with it. It's a good bit of advice because to not do that is to be unstable, right? It's what he says right here, stand fast. But the opposite of standing fast is instability. I move forward, I move backwards, I rock to and fro. I'm really not sure where I stand. You've got to take a stand and do things right in the Lord's eyes, especially as the world comes in, and sometimes it comes from within, to have you somehow bend. I read this a while back, and I wrote it down, because here was one fellow's definition of standing fast. Here's what he wrote. My face is set, my gait is fast. My goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough. My companions are few, my guide is reliable. My mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, or lured away, turned back, diluted, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice or hesitate in the presence of adversity. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy or ponder at the pool of popularity or meander in a maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, or slow up until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, and stored up for Christ. That's a good bit of it. I don't think you could do it on a t-shirt, but that's not bad. <laughs> Instability causes anxiety. I know what I believed yesterday. I'm not sure what I believed today. I don't think I let the Lord down. I wish I'd have said what I didn't say. Oh, if I could just be a little stronger. Stand fast. It overcomes stability. We can't give up now. Secondly, we have to battle not only instability, but disunity. Paul says in verse 2, I implore Yodia, and I implore. Now the way you pronounce it in Hebrew is suntuke. To be of the same mind of the Lord, and I urge you also, true companion, that you help these women who have labored with me in the gospel, who have labored with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. The word implore, and it's used twice to refer to both of these ladies, um, is the word for begging or pleading. So stand fast, one. Second of all, you've got to fight against disunity. And by the way, if you're having a daughter soon, soon 2K, skip that one. <laughs> now, these two women are interesting because we are given their names from a local setting. Paul writes to a church he's well familiar with and the people that he's known for a decade or more. He's very well aware of what's going on. Remember, he had their pastor come and visit him. He almost died there, but he, he got all the scoop. He knew all of the stories. He, you know, he's spoken to folks as they've come and went. They are only heard from here. They are not mentioned anywhere else. But they're, they're involved in some obvious disagreement. We don't have any details of the dispute. But we're given enough to know what's going on. And Paul gives us the solution so that we might be able to apply it in our own lives. Notice that these two women, these two sisters, whose names are in the book of life, who've been in ministry for a long time, they are women of stature. They have a long reputation. These aren't young Christians. They have longevity. They've been effective for ministry purposes for years. But now they're feuding in the body. And it has gotten destructive and ugly, and it is unbecoming, and it has brought disunity, which can bring tremendous Anxiety. There's no peace when you're in strife. There, there they are over there. I hate them. There's really not much peace. Notice that in Paul's description of the ladies themselves that he says in verse 3 that they had worked with Paul, they had worked with Clement, they had been involved with a lot of the ministry teams that Paul was involved with. Maybe they were part of that original group that came down to the river there in Acts 16, which Paul and, and Silas met with and then you remember that one lady, Lydia, and her household were saved. And eventually that's where the church kind of started in her home. But she met with a few women. Now we don't know, but these women have been around a long time. And it could very well be that they were that group. But in any case, they were well-known and well-established. Tremendous influence, lots of followers. And now, not only was the church in arms because of them, but people were taking sides. <laughs> well, I've always liked her. Well, I've always liked her. Well, she's always been nice to me, boy. The Lord's used her. Yeah, but the Lord's used her too. 
and people were starting to line up, and they'd both been in ministry for a long time. They did great things in the Lord. They served with others. But notice that their presence in the church now was polarizing, and the disagreement and the, and the debate and the contention had been festering, and it had gotten to the point where in, in this great letter of joy, Paul was able to use that situation and say, here's something that will rob you of your joy. Here's anxiety and pressure and difficulty that will steal from you what God wants to do. And, and, and whatever effectiveness verse 3 describes, it was now being hindered by their disunity. And not just theirs, but it appears it was affecting lots of people. So that folks were in on it. There was a lot of whispering going on, you know. And Satan's most effective arrow, his hottest flame, is usually in, in getting Christians to turn against each other and especially go after those who are effective. You know, the girl's problems in verse 2 brought Satan's, you know, attack because of verse 3. They were so involved in serving. If you say to me, well, Satan never hassles me, I would say to you, that's not a good sign. Because if he has reason to leave you alone and you're no threat to him, you're probably not doing much good either. But these women were out there, man. They were serving, and now they've gotten into this situation. Now, I doubt if this situation is unfamiliar to us. You, you know how the enemy works, and... And maybe you've been a part of that in church or, 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 or elsewhere. But, you know, it doesn't take long for people to exchange words about something. And soon they're not talking to each other. And then they're sitting on other sides of the church service. Or, uh, what church service do you go to? I'm going to the second. Okay, I'm going to the third. I don't even want to see you, you know. They walk by. They look the other way. And then the spouses get involved in the squabble. Then you get sympathizers to, to sign up on both sides. And the story is told and retold to anyone who will listen. And you'll, you'll put your particular spin on it depending on what side you've taken. And there's no one standing fast in the Lord now, man. Everybody's just slipping around, you know, and sliding. And there is great disunity. And Satan knows us. And our weakness is very well. And in this area of fellowship amongst the saints is a great place where pride and self can greatly destroy. It's not, it's not any fun for anyone to be the hurt party or, or believe you are. <laughs> I, I've been hurt. I've been mistreated. I've, you've done me wrong. And I'm telling everyone. And regardless of the cost, we want our due. And in the process, the testimony of the church is compromised and the church is harmed. And especially when neither people give an inch and they refuse because they were wronged. And Satan rejoices and he feeds both sides. And Sometimes, you know, people leave churches and they go, oh, I'm just going somewhere else. I'm going to look for a more congenial, more godly, caring, Jesus-like people than here. Nothing's solved. Now, the only time these two women's names are mentioned in the Bible are right here, and they are known for their argument. <laughs> and I thought, do you really want your name in the Bible for argumentativeness, you know? These women sure could fight. And they never did get along. Let me just give you their names. You know, and history immortalizes their names, and they couldn't resolve it. And Paul deals with it in a couple of fronts. First of all, verse 2, he begs them to stand up and do the right thing. He, he confronts them, if you will, uh, head on, and he says to them from verse 2 that the problem is bilateral. In other words, it isn't just one person's problem. Most conflict among Christians have two sides and they're both wrong, aren't they? I mean, marriage counseling is usually the way it is. Arguments are usually the way it is. You can argue your case till you know, you get blue, but... Um, and, I, and I thought about, you know, Epaphras Dides takes this, this letter back home, and now he's got the whole church sitting down and he starts reading. And, and he's mentioned a couple of times as we've gone through this, like, stuff that isn't really good, like, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Stand fast with one spirit and one mind, striving in unity, you know, for the faith of the gospel. He said in chapter uh, 2, don't do anything through selfish ambition or conceit. And I can imagine as they're reading those kind of words that these women are staring at each other. That's probably you he's talking about, you know. They, they, maybe they sit in teams. they got different color shirts. I don't have any idea. And they're glaring at each other. And then their names come up and the hammer falls. Chapter 4, therefore I implore Yodia, and you've got to be kidding me. And their names are mentioned. And you just have to believe that angry glares all turn to Epaphras, Epaphrodites. Why'd you rat us out, Paul? Why'd you talk to Paul about us, man? I am never speaking to you again, you backbiter. <laughs> and one cries, and the other steams, and 
the group marches out of the meeting. Paul started off in verse 1 by saying, I love you dearly. <laughs> You're my brethren. I miss you guys, but we can't have this. And Paul, fortunately, spares us the details of the division because I suspect that the people he was writing to knew very well what was going on. But he does say to them, look, come around at some point and say to yourself, I've got to make this right in the eyes of the Lord. I've got to turn to him, right? I've got to be of the same mind. Now, you should know, and I guess you do, that, that Christians are oftentimes not the, of the same mind in, in a lot of things. You know, if you look around here, you, you, you'll see that fashion, not everyone's on the same page. Hairstyles, not everyone's got a tattoo. Not everyone likes, you know, jeans. Some folks need button down. Why are you wearing that t-shirt? You know, you go out to the car and we turn on your car. We're going to hear all kinds of different music because of your taste. We don't have to agree. Sports teams, <laughs> there's forever a problem amongst the Christians who they're cheering for. Politics. There's a hundred different solutions to problems. Everybody's got an idea. You know, we don't like the same foods. We can even doctrinally be in disagreement about a lot of things that don't matter. Not primary doctrines, but things of, that are secondary in nature and that are important, but, but they're not eternal threats and they're not keeping you from God's best. So we can disagree about a lot of stuff, but when it comes to getting along, there really isn't any margin in the Bible for us letting that go or, or, or not dealing with it altogether. We, we, we aren't allowed to be selfish and, and prideful and, and gossipy and, and, and team building when it comes to that idea of building my team for my purpose. It, it hurts the heart of God. It causes you know, disrespect to the, to the work of Christ. It, it makes us look terrible. So Paul turns to them and he says, look, you have to be of the same mind, you two ladies. But he adds these words, in the Lord. And I think that's the dividing line. In fact, notice verse 1, stand fast, in the Lord. Have the same mind, verse 2, in the Lord. Verse 4, rejoice, in the Lord. It's one of Paul's favorite little phrases. It literally, I think Paul is saying, move your argument to spiritual ground. Move your, your difficulties and your, your disrespect for one another. Move it to where the Lord is involved. Put it on a spiritual level rather than just a worldly one. And make his glory your aim and his will your will. And you'll find that things are going to work out here. I mean, we had gone through chapter 2 and saw that Jesus is the supreme example of making peace between God and men by the way that he humbled himself. And he, and he was God, but he put that off, didn't he? He put off all of those independent use of his authority. And he came and he gave his life to make peace between God and man. In the Lord. So look, if you have someone you're griping against and you're fighting with and you're holding on to and you're, you're going to get people to help you, um, knock it off. In the Lord, man. Yeah, but I'm right. I don't care if you're, you're wrong in the, in the, the way that you're declaring to be right. If both of these women spiritually did that, sought the Lord, there'd be no more dispute. They might not resolve their initial problem, but the problem will get resolved. You know, God will take care of it. So Paul's first method of dealing with conflict was, you know, or battling disunity was, was head on. Hey, I implore, I beg you women in the Lord, get along, man. Get on the same page. Let God into this thing, because it's ridiculous. Second of all, verse 3, he also calls in some help. Right? He, he, he gets some outside help, an intercessor. The word's a true companion. I urge you also. The word urge and implore, same word. I'm begging you also, my true companion. It's a singular term. Uh, it's an unnamed person. The word companion in Greek is sudzagos. And it is believed, at least by some Bible scholars, that that was his name. <laughs> he was a companion and a helper. And it could be. There's really no way to determine it. Some believe it was his name, but, but, but in any event, sometimes in conflict, it is good to get an objective third-party mediator, isn't it? I mean, there's some value to Christian counsel amongst ourselves when things get to a point where you just can't resolve them alone. Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians, said, look, if, if someone's overtaken in a trespass, you that are spiritual, restore them in a spirit of gentleness and consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. I have found over the years that people will come to counseling 
but they will refuse to return because what they hear is not what they wanted to hear. And so they don't allow anybody to help fix the problem because they don't want to fix the problem. They want to just recruit you to their side. Yeah, I've got two of the pastors on my side now. Pastor, tell them I'm right. <laughs> a fool has no delight in understanding, but just in expressing his own heart. It's a proverb, chapter 18. Look, disunity can be overcome if we are willing to humble ourselves and willing to hear from others what God wants us to know. That, that, that can happen in a lot of ways. You can come to church here in the group dynamics of a, a, a big, large Bible study where it's kind of one direction and you get to sit and listen and you can hear from the Lord all kinds of things and if you're willing to apply them to your life, you know, then, then that may be all you need to, to straighten out. Sometimes it is best that you are in a smaller group and, and we have smaller groups that meet. We have home fellowships that meet and Mondays and Wednesdays, women and men meet together. We have prayer meetings of just smaller groups. And sometimes that's more helpful because then someone can personally come to you and it's a two-way street and you go, dude, that's what you're doing, just stupid. You know, you got to stop. But sometimes you need the surgical approach, right? <laughs> the more precise approach, a one-on-one -on -one that, that can bring great deliverance. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, Proverbs says, but he who heeds counsel is wise. So Paul says to the woman, knock it off in the Lord. You're battling disunion. This is going to call off all kinds of stress. And then he says to his friend, whoever he is, whether that's his name or that's just his friend, help these women. They have labored with me in the gospel. They have served with Clement. They have been a part of our other fellow workers. We know that they know the Lord. These weren't unsaved folks. And, and Paul knew that I think it was going to take more than a sentence of public rebuke to fix the problem. So could you help them? Get them together, take them to lunch, call them on this, you know, step in, facilitate resolution to God's glory. And, and notice that the minute he does that, he turns around and compliments both of the women again. They had labored, and the word means they had worn themselves out in ministry with me. They have a great reputation. They, they are godly people. They are mature saints. This isn't the young believers that were causing problems. God had used them mightily together, but now the enemy had gotten in and lines were being drawn in the sand. So Paul asked for help to soften the blow of public rebuke, of reading their name publicly to help heal the wounds. And there'd been this lengthy kind of acrimonious, um, hurtful division. And a lot of people were getting scarred. But Paul is the first guy to say, I know they're saved. This isn't a salvation issue. This is a family deal. And their names are in the book of life. And, and, and somehow that fact ought to be more important than any other when you have to clear up, you know, real problems and issues. I always thought, you know, remember when the disciples came back and the Lord said, oh, how did it go? And they said, oh, even the enemy is subject to your name. <laughs> the spirits are subject to you. And Jesus said, well, that's great, but you should be happier about this. Your name is written in the book of life. So more than any of these problems, we're going to heaven, aren't we? And we need to take as many folks with us as we can. So, you know, if you have a grudge tonight or an axe to grind or you're gathering support and whispering in the halls and feeling justified and, you know, God hates those who divide the brethren anyway. It's one of those seven things that he hates. I would always look at that list and just make sure you don't do that. He hates that. Not good to do what God hates. But get right with God and let it go and die to yourself and walk in love. I was reading the other day about the, the sequoias in California. The, you know, they're sometimes 300 feet tall or more, 80 feet, a couple of them in circumference. The botanists say they're 4,000 years old. But then you say, well, how in the world do they stand with all that weight? And it's interesting that, that you know, their roots not only go deep, but they intertwine with the roots of the trees around them. And by intertwining, they anchor themselves against what is traditionally a pretty windy area in Northern California. So best to hang on to others, right? as the wind blows. Well-connected people in the body of Christ stand the test of time. So battle um, disunity. Battle instability. Battle disunity. Thirdly, battle despondency. Verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, let me just say that. Rejoice. Rather than having all of these petty arguments or being pushed aside by the louder group in the world, Overcome the hurts and the selfish interests by focusing on the Lord who has your name in the book of life. Look, when you rejoice in Jesus, divisions stop. 
When your mind is focused on him, discord disappears. Life can get pretty grim, right? And some burdens can almost crush you into the dust, and, and, and painful things can sometimes overwhelm us. Regrets torment people for years. Paul says the answer to all of that is the same. Just rejoice in the Lord. What does that mean? Well, it means I know that God's in charge. I know that he works all things together for good. I know that he doesn't waste my tears. I know that I'm going to heaven. I know that he does all things well. I know that he's for me and not against me. I know that he's going to finish the work that he started. That he loves me. That he knows my needs before I ask. Rejoice in the Lord. Put your mind on all of the things you know. And again, this is written as a command, not a suggestion. Look, if there was anyone I think that could be despondent, it was Paul. He'd been in prison for at least four years now, uninterruptedly, initially for something he didn't do, but continuing because he had simply loved the Lord. So there hasn't been a break in his life in years, and now they might kill him, cut his head off. There's the church in Rome, many of them, who, who should be at his side, who've decided, man, it's too dangerous. Or they take advantage of Paul. Or they didn't ever like him much anyway. All kinds of junk going on. It seems to me if anybody wanted to look back over his life and say, well, I had some good years, but the last four years just stink. It could have been Paul. What does he do? I'm just rejoicing in the Lord always. His trial was in doubt. The condition of his good friend Epaphrodites had just until recently been in question. Rejoice in the Lord always. But notice the words again, in the Lord. Look, the words in the Lord describe the Christian life, right? We are in the Lord. Before you were saved, you were not in the Lord. Tonight, you're in the Lord. I, I read of a guy a couple of months ago who, uh, he's an old-timer, but, but he wrote, uh, when I met Christ, I felt like I swallowed sunshine. <laughs> I thought it was a great title. I think every church has its pessimists, don't they? They're hard to be around. It's like watching an autopsy, getting around these people. Oh, yeah, they're still dead. I don't know. Rejoice in the Lord always. Now, you read that, and you want to say to yourself, well, this guy's a little idealistic, right? I mean, what a stupid thing to say. How can we possibly rejoice in, always in the Lord? But then you look who wrote it, and you realize that Paul wasn't, Paul wasn't disconnected from reality. But, but he had a deep sense of peace and rest because he was established in the truth after 30 years. He even wrote to the Corinthians, I am always, no, he wrote, I am sorrowful, but as I'm sorrowful, I am always rejoicing. As a description of the difficulties that he faced. Oh man, I've seen some sorrow, but I can't lose the joy that I have in the Lord. Because of who he is. And he lived that way. When he first came to Philippi 12 years earlier, you remember, they were arrested and beaten and they th were thrown into the deepest dungeon at midnight. And then you read that Paul and Silas sang worship songs. That's not normal. Silas could have said, Paul, we spent months looking for where we wanted to go. We run out of land. And you say, oh, the Lord sent you a guy saying in Macedonia, come to us and we come over here. We ain't here two weeks. We're just whooped. Quit dreaming, man. It's curtain. We don't like when you have a vision. You're always wrong. But they sang. And God must have liked it because there was an earthquake, which I assume is God tapping his feet. He liked the worship. And the jailer came running, asking what he must do to be saved. And I don't know if he'd have come running, if all he had heard down the, the way was the grumbling and complaining of guys that just thought, sure, sure they got the short end of the stick. But they weren't like that. They were rejoicing in the Lord always. In fact, he who has a, of a merry heart, Proverbs 15 says, is of a, has a continual feast. The party doesn't stop for a man filled with joy. Every morning, every night, in traffic, over time, doesn't matter. Praise the Lord. I'm rejoicing in him. Does joy permeate your life? Do, you, do people get around you and laughter rings out? And Paul says, come on, ladies, let's let Jesus have this dissension and let him restore your joy. Fourthly, finally, verse 5, we have to battle bitterness, which can certainly steal your joy. Let your, we read, gentleness be known to all men the Lord is at hand. 
Let that be your reputation. Let your gentleness be known to all men. May you be a person in the Lord known not for stubbornness like these two women, not for selfishness, not for fleshiness, but may people know you for your gentleness. Or the, the word literally translated forbearing means that you just take a lot, that you have a heart that is forbearing, and you do so because the Lord is at hand. It is easy when surrounded by opposing earthly, fleshly groups or when you're battling saints to begin with that you can develop some kind of rough edges, you know? You used to be kind of nice and quiet and easy going, but man, you've seen one too many battles and the scars are everywhere now. And you're no longer able to be gentle. You're, you're kind of like, you know, you're, you're quick to argue and sometimes you'll even defend it by saying, well, I'm just arguing for Jesus' sake. But the Lord says this, be gentle. I, I read somewhere um, that, that the definition of gentle was a sweet reasonableness or a lenient mercy to those who sin and whose fault it is. It's a fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. After all, you're following Jesus. He said, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. I am what? Gentle and lowly of heart. So if both of these ladies had taken that, that, that route, they would have dissolved the problem. And, and I love the fact that Paul says, hey, the Lord's at hand. And I, I, I'm sure that he means the Lord is coming. But more than that, it just means the Lord's near. Right? We can be gentle because God's with us. I, I'd have to fight back if I thought, if I left it like that, I was just going to lose. But I'm not going to lose. I'm going to win. Because the Lord is near. He knows what we're facing. He wants to be glorified in every situation. You want to be known for your gentleness, not for your pig-headedness. It's not even in this chapter. You don't want to be that guy. So look, the battles we face and that we see are real and they're personal and they're spiritual and they require real answers and biblical responses. For instability, we have to learn to, to not move. Whatever group you're in that's pushing, don't move. Now, we don't have to be foolish. We don't have to be offensive. But we really can't move. I can't change my mind about abortion because the country thinks that's the right thing to do. Can't do it. I mean, ask your answer to the Lord. You get a lot of people mad at you. It may be, but better them than he. I want to be sure he's happy. I, I can't move. I, I can't move. When it comes to disunity, I've got to have the same mind as my brethren in the Lord. We serve one God. God uses us alike. Our names are in the book of life. The enemy would like to divide. God would like to remove that pressure and bring us to a place where we're not, we don't have disunity, but we work hard towards unity. And sometimes that helps. You know, we need the body to help us see the light, but if, if we can work at it from both sides, we should be able to get rid of these problems and all. And then... Get rid of despondency it means rejoicing in the Lord. You know, there's a lot of depression these days, right? I mean, the suicide rate in our country has skyrocketed the last five years. People are giving up. Another actor killed himself with heroin this week. Had it all, he had all that the world could offer and still had an empty heart. So, you know, we're better off rejoicing. Make a list of all God's done and forget about the other list. Rejoice in him. And then avoid being rough, caustic. You know. It's so difficult when people lose that tender heart from the Lord. I want to read you a story that I read that I, it was so touched me that it was on the subject of gentleness. It was actually written by a mom um, and a focus on the ba uh, family article. But this is what she wrote, and I, I thought it was very sweet. She said, last week I took my children out to a restaurant and my six-year-old child asked if he could say grace. And I said, that'd be wonderful. So we bowed our heads and he prayed, God is good. God is great. Thank you for our food. And I would thank you even more if my mommy would buy us ice cream and liberty and justice for all. Amen. <laughs> well, along with the laughter she wrote at the table and those sitting nearby, I heard a woman remark loudly behind us, this is what is wrong with our country. 
Kids today don't even know how to pray. Imagine asking God for ice cream. Well, hearing this, this young boy, six years old, began to cry. And he said, Mommy, did I do it wrong? Is God mad at me? As I held him and comforted him, assuring him he had done a terrific job, an elderly man from a table over stood up and came to our table, winked at my son and said, I happen to know that God thought that was a great prayer. Really, said the young boy, cross my heart. Then in a whisper, he said of that woman to the young boy, too bad she never asked God for ice cream. <laughs> a little ice cream is good for the soul sometimes. She wrote, well, naturally, I bought my kids ice cream at the end of the meal. And my son stared at his for quite some time before doing something that I will never forget. He picked up his Sunday, and without a word walked over and placed it in front of the woman and said, here, ice cream's good for the soul sometime. And my soul is good already. <laughs> Father, tonight as we sit together, we do pray, Father, that you would give to us your heart. And that in terms of, of the, the fear and the anxiety, the frustration and, and the worry that so often the enemy can introduce into our lives because we won't stand fast and we won't forgive and, and, and take our place of having the mind of Christ. And we're not so quick to rejoice in all that we've been given. And we're quick to be rough and not gentle. Lord, may those things be dealt with in our lives tonight so that we might win. Win over fear, win over anxiety, win over the pressures that the enemy would like to bring upon our lives so he could stagnate us and, and shelf us and make us useless and ineffective, surviving, not moving forward, not gaining ground, but just getting by. And Lord, tonight, if there are folks in our body that are at odds with each other, may you bring healing. And, and forgiveness and mercy and humility and may in the Lord Father we, we find that our names written in the book of life we need to work this out if there are those tonight who are pressured to compromise in their faith they're ashamed of not speaking up or not standing firm help them to see there's nothing wrong with not moving everyone can have an opinion and they can have theirs and they know you and though others may not listen we certainly don't have to give up what we've been given for those who are discouraged tonight or depressed or upset, Lord, with, with the way you're handling their lives or things aren't working out the way that they seem and their plans are, seem to be different than yours, may they find, Lord, tonight great joy in you, in your salvation, in your love, in your devotion to us, in your promise to finish what you've began, to never leave us, that you're going to be here tomorrow when we wake up and tomorrow night when we go home that you've got our best will in mind, that your plans are for good and not evil to give us an expected end, to give us a future and a hope. And Lord, that this evening, that you would make us soft and gentle people in a world that is crass and hard and edgy and, and, and out for itself, that we might have the gentleness that comes from Jesus, that you might see, or that the others might see you in us. And that in, as the result, we know that you're at hand, you're near, you're with us. And there's no need for us to be very cutting or very harsh when we know the Lord's in charge. But we stand our ground, and we do so in love, rejoicing in you. If tonight you need prayer for any of the things that we've looked at that certainly the Lord brought you tonight just to deal with for you, come and grab one of the pastors after the service and just... Ask them to pray. Maybe you don't know the Lord like you should. Then tell them that. Or you've not accepted Christ into your heart. Jesus isn't the Lord of your life. It's hard to be in the Lord when you're not really having a relationship with the Lord. He first has to be your Lord. To be in the Lord. You can tell them that as well. Next week, be anxious for nothing. It's going to be a good week. <laughs> don't worry about anything. Wow, if we could just get that done, huh? That would be God's will for us. Shall we stand?